Um, I'm Kat Tremlett. I'm the Harmful Content Manager here at the Southwest Grid for Learning. And um, I wanted to talk to you about the service that I run called Report Harmful Content. And then after I've had a little summary of that, um, Kate's going to have a chat to you about the service she works on, the Revenge Porn Helpline. So without further ado, let's get going. Um, I Yeah, OK, let's, let's crack on. I think I just wanted to start to let you know that um, we both work for a wider organisation called the Southwest Grid for Learning, and that organisation um, runs three national helplines. So we have the Professionals Online Safety Helpline, who is um, a helpline for any member of the children's workforce, so anyone that works with children in any capacity, um, with online issues that they face or issues that the children are supporting my face and um, we obviously run the revenge porn helpline that Kate will go into more detail about shortly um, but essentially supports adult victims of intimate image abuse and then report harmful content which is my service and I'll talk a little bit about more in a minute and um, two of those helplines the report harmful content and the professionals online safety helpline are part of a wider umbrella organisation called the UK Safer Internet Centre. Um, I won't get too bogged down in semantics, but that's kind of comprised of three charities, South Grid for Learning, where we work, ChildNet, who do kind of online um, safety resources for children and young people, and the Internet Watch Foundation, who are the national reporting centre for child sexual abuse material in the UK. Um, so, report harmful content, what is it? A national reporting centre provided by the UK Safer Internet Centre, which basically gives everyone the tools they need to report harmful content online. Um, we're here to support you in reporting content which violates any community guidelines on those most commonly used networks and social media sites. Um, we do <laughs> by providing advice about all manner of online harms that someone might experience. You can see on the little screenshot there, the advice tab, if you clicked on that on the website, then basically it sort of takes you to all types of harms that you might experience. It gives you a kind of overview of the generic stance on a lot of these platforms and then buttons on how to report that. This is about intimate image abuse online. Hmm. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, not quite sure what happened there. Someone, did someone have a question or shall I carry on? I'll carry on then. Uh, anyway, so that, that the advice section and, and whoever just mentioned intimate image abuse, there is a section on there around intimate image abuse there. And Kate will talk more about intimate image abuse in the second part of this presentation as well. Um, so that's part of the service. And the other half of the service is our mediatory role, where we provide a kind of middleman sort of escalation point for people who've made, made reports to commonly used social networks about these eight types of issues. Um, so they will have made the correct report, but perhaps the content hasn't been removed or if in the case of a hacked account or, or um, age sensitivity kind of in relation to adult content, there might need to be a filter applied. If those things haven't happened, then we have contacts at industry that were able to kind of escalate that content with to try and get the correct action taken. Um, and yeah, that's only with the caveat that the correct report needs to have been made by the client in the first instance. Um, a lot of the questions we get when people come to us are, are, is this is what's happening to me criminal or is it not um, and the answer is often quite subjective because obviously online harm um, you know what might be considered harmful to someone um, is, is very subjective it could be you know a, someone else could brush it off and not have an issue with it at all um, so I think it's just important to to say that we have this when should you go to the police part of the website where people can have a look at these different parts of legislation and how they do um, kind of correlate to online harms. Um, and it might help you make a kind of more considered decision about what is going on for you. But ultimately, if, if, if you're experiencing something that you feel is putting you in danger, then of course we would recommend that you bring the police. Um, well, yeah. I think what I'd say about the, the bits of legislation that are on this part of the website is that we continually study case law and consult with law enforcement researchers working in the field of online criminal law and the Law Commission. So we're taking on board feedback from those kind of official bodies, but also our clients all the time to make sure that that, that information is as up to date as possible. But that's with the caveat that it will be very much tailored to the sorts of cases that we're seeing. So we want to make sure that the trends that we're seeing and um, we're providing the information that we, we feel our clients need um, first and foremost, of course. 
Um, so a little bit about our journey so far. We're a relatively new service um, out of the three helplines that the Southwest Grid is the newest out of the three. Um, so in 2018, we had these conversations and developed the platform and the idea behind it. And, and because we had those established partnerships with industry through our other helplines, um, we were able to kind of put an effort, a lot of effort into working with focus groups and young people themselves, but also adults as well. Um, this obviously coincided with the launch of the online harms white paper from the government. Um, so uh, there's no mistake in the timing. Um, we we realised that there, as much as people are trying to kind of implement regulation of online harm, um, there needs to be people and services such as ourselves that are here to help people who are experiencing it. Um, so in summer, we, we, we took on board a lot of feedback from the kind of initial pilot phase and had a little rebuild of the website and officially launched in December 2019. Then we had the, the, the coronavirus bomb that hit in 2020. And I think I've done pretty well, um, 10 minutes without mentioning the C word. So, <laughs> um, but that has massively shaped the service last year I mean obviously it's our first proper year of service anyway because we only launched in December 2019 officially um, but with the restrictions pushing more people online of course we saw more reports and and it was interesting to see how the trend sort of changed throughout lockdown lockdown periods and then again when sort of there was a slight easing of restrictions um, but I think one thing to say is that with other services that are working in kind of domestic violence and domestic abuse climate, quite often people would say that the calls and case numbers have increased um, in line with lockdown, but then when lockdown is eased, they've kind of seen an easing off, of course, but that certainly hasn't been the case for, for our services. Um, it's almost as if we've sort of opened the floodgates a little bit. <laughs> so we have seen a lot of reports and they just have maintained at quite high level. Um, which, I mean, in some ways, we're just really pleased that we're able to provide some level of support to people that perhaps haven't found it elsewhere. Um, but of course, it does raise that slightly wider concerning societal issue that, that people are experiencing this on a much, much larger scale than perhaps was a, originally thought. Um, we released our first annual report last May, and we, we've actually um, established a lot of new partnerships in the latter part of last year, particularly around dating apps. So we've partnered with the match group so that we have an escalation route to escalate reports on their suite of apps, which is about seven different dating apps. Um, we've also got a couple more in the pipeline um, for any of you that are interested. We are hoping to shortly confirm a partnership with the Bumble group um, of dating apps and also um, Ubo, which is a kind of messaging service that young people quite often use. But at the moment, I like to show this slide. This is kind of what the partnerships looks like on Report Harmful Content. So they're all the services that we're able to uh, offer that kind of mediatory role and that escalation where content's been reported, but perhaps not actioned in accordance with an industry's terms and conditions. And I think I will leave it there for this particular moment in time. Thanks very much for listening on that. And I would say questions now, but I think I am just going to, I think, shall we power through, Kate, and then... Um, and say questions at the end, unless, of course, anyone's got any burning questions they need to ask, please pop it in the chat or unmute and just shout at us, but in a nice way. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, on to you, Kate. Crack on. Yeah. Thanks, Kat. Um, I'm going to have to do a bit of a Chris Witty here and ask for the next slide every now and then. I wish I had a picture of a slide. <laughs> I know. Um, so, hi, um, my name is Kate Wellington and I am a practitioner on the Revenge Porn Helpline. Um, I've been with the Helpline for two and a half years, so um, I've, I've been through it all. I've, um, I've definitely sort of um, rooted myself quite well within the position of the Helpline and um, I'm really excited to be able to talk to you guys today. So, um, we're also under the umbrella of Southwest Grid for Learning, but we are funded by the Home Office, um, three years funding at a time. So. Um, our funding is slightly different but we still have the same um, team and office and everything as the report harmful content and professional and safety helpline so we share those contacts between the two of us okay i think you put yourself on mute sorry <laughs> 
sorry, I pressed the space bar to um to change slides, thinking that I could do it and muted myself. I apologise. Um, <laughs> so the elephant in the room is our name. So revenge porn helpline. Um, I personally don't use the word revenge porn. We are the helpline. We try not to. We use the phrase intimate image abuse, and um, as it's not always revenge and it's not porn. These are illegal, non-consensual images being shared without consent, um, which is against the law. So um, this includes intimate images shared without consent, threats to share intimate images, which isn't actually um, a specific law at the moment, but Refuge are, we're working with Refuge on a big campaign to try and get that included under the domestic um, abuse bill. So you may have seen quite a lot of um, media around that and there is a petition. So if anyone is interested, I would head to their webpage. Um, if you type in Refuge the Naked Threat, um, it should come up and there is a petition there, um, which is going really successfully successfully um so have a look at that and then um intimate images taken without consent which is a sexual offense called voyeurism sextortion um this is um webcam blackmail essentially um where people are befriended on facebook um or other platforms as well um sexual interaction occurs images videos exchanged or recorded without their consent ah, thanks joe popping the link there um, and then they're blackmailed for money or threats to share it with their family and friends. Um, and then also upskirting, which came into the UK law in the, in the last few years. Um, we can also provide advice on... I've muted myself again. So these are the three main types of intimate image abuse can happen. Um, the most common ones that we see on the helpline. So intimate images shared without consent. Um, this could be between um, ex-partners. It could be between um, people you don't know. It may be people who have found images online and they sort of started collecting them with other personal information and things like that. Um, but we can help to remove them. So that's a large part of what we do. Um, intimate images threaten to be shared. Again, this can be between ex-partners, but not always. We're really trying to break the stigma that revenge porn or intimate image abuse isn't always between the ex-partner relationship. It doesn't have to be that to be included in law, which um, is a quite a common myth that we see. And then sextortion, as I've just explained, that's a large proportion of our cases as well. And since the lockdown, we saw a massive, massive rise in this. Um, I think it's kind of attributed towards people being potentially home alone, lonely, isolated, away from those sort of impersonal connections. Um, so we, we definitely have seen a rise. So the main law that we work with is the Criminal Justice and Courts Act. This was brought in in 2015 and the helpline sort of followed um, a few months pretty much the same time in 2015. Um, it was founded by Laura Higgins, who is an absolutely amazing woman, and um, she'll always be an inspiration. Um, and she formed a helpline from the Professional Online Safety Helpline um, within the Southwest Grid for Learning. So the offence is to disclose a private sexual image without consent with the intention of causing distress. So this law is, it's great to have a law, but it is quite problematic in many ways. So um, only private sexual images are included. So that would have to be something which wouldn't be normally seen in public. So it wouldn't be a topless sunbathing picture or anything like that. It has to be um, defined as private and sexual. Yeah, yeah. Um, the intent to cause distress is also quite problematic as um, we've often seen that there are quite a lot of defenses for why this isn't causing distress, um, which could include um, I thought they'd find it funny, I didn't think they'd mind, I didn't think they'd find out, etc. So at the moment, the Law Commission is doing the full review of this law, and we're hoping for it to become a little bit more um, sort of powerful and sort of a bit more solid. So again, you can find more information about that um, through the Law Commission. I'm, I'm sure I can pop a link at the end if Joe can't find it. Um, but it is a great piece of work and it, it's quite interesting to have a read on. So what does our helpline do? Um, to say that we work within such a narrow field, we actually do quite a lot. So we can support anyone in the UK who is over the age of 18. For under 18s, having your images shared without consent is very different. That would be classed as child sexual abuse um, and CSAM and would have to be reported to the Internet Watch Foundation, who do work to remove that content online. So it's not that there isn't anyone that can do that. So we provide a helpline, we offer non 
judgmental, confidential advice and support. Um, at the moment, we're email only due to the pandemic. We're working from home um, part time. So we're in the office a few days, um, but we're not offering the helpline phone. But we can provide the same amount of advice and support by our email, our anonymous whisper tool and Facebook Messenger. So a large part of what we do is reporting and removal of content. Obviously, we can't do that from our homes. So that's why we go into the office a few days a week during the pandemic. So if your image has been shared on a site such as X Hamster, um, we've spent the last five years building up quite good relationships with these websites to ensure that we can have these removed quickly, promptly um, as possible, which is often what victims come to us for. Um, they basically just want this content down as fast as possible and we can we can help with that. In the last year, we've got a 93% success rate, so we're pretty good at what we do. Um, there's only three help plan practitioners and we are all incredibly stubborn women um, who will fight to the death to try and get that content down for someone um, and we, we, we really do um, understand the impact on having this content online does to victims so we are we are very working hard to help with that um, so as well as um, RHC we also can give advice on community guidelines and how to report users content on social media we have the same escalation routes to Facebook Instagram Twitter those types of things to try and that content taken down and um, these types of platforms they have worked um quite hard recently to um sort of improve their reporting routes for non-consensual imagery um, and we have a lot of advice on that on our website but if for say um the website isn't taking it down we we can also escalate that to them to try and add a bit more context behind the report and um get that taken on a little bit more quickly for review and obviously reporting to the police is quite a big thing and um, so we can give advice around um, what kind of evidence you need to gather, how to approach the police. Um, we work with a legal advice centre at Queen Mary University um, called SPITE and they are absolutely wonderful so we often signpost um, victims there to get some more legal advice um, and we will do our best to try and signpost to other organisations who we think might be able to provide more support as well. So the Facebook pilot. So um, I often start by saying that it's not really a pilot anymore as because it's been going for a fair few years now, I think since 2017. But essentially this works to um, digitally hash intimate images and videos to prevent them from being shared to Facebook, Facebook Messenger and Instagram. So we are the UK partner for this project. So um, we can refer victims who are say, having their images threatened to be shared on these um, platforms, which is quite common with sextortion, but also um, relationship breakdowns, um, exposure of um, sex workers, um, identity and things like that. So um, we all we need is an email address for that victim who then receives the link from Facebook. They'll upload the images um, to a secure one use only link. The images are hashed, which means it's given a digital barcode and they are prevented from being uploaded. And if they are if someone tries to, um, they will be notified of that as well. So it's a pretty robust system and we've been working with it for a fair while now. And I would say it really, really does help people in so many situations, um, especially um, with leaving um, domestic abuse and um, abusive um, relationships where that's a really big hold on someone to say if you leave me I'll share your images with your mum on Facebook it's quite a credible threat it's something that really could happen so having this in place can really help people feel reassured to be able to to um to leave those relationships and also with sextortion that's off often a big threat of I've screenshotted your friends list and I will send these images to your to your mum, your friends, your grandma, etc. Um, and it is Facebook and Instagram are places where you do have a lot of your family connections and it's not somewhere that you want this content to be shared at all. So it's a very reassuring tool that we have under our belt. So students and universities, we've been working on this for a fair while now. So um, there are lots of different sort of issues that can occur um, with students and university students as well. Um, experiencing freedom, that's quite a big one that we see sort of September, October time. Obviously not the moment because COVID stops people 
being that free. Um, but in the past that we have seen that um, it can lead to risky behaviour of people thinking it's OK to record someone having sex and sharing that or um, people are feeling a bit more free. They're having new relationships, which they might not do. Potentially, they don't have the understanding and education of privacy tools in place. Um, so, so our website does explain that. We find that, unfortunately, international students are are often at risk of sextortion where they've moved over um, to a new country, they don't potentially have um, a massive group of friends and they seek friendship and relationships online. And in a, in a small number of these cases, they, they do unfortunately turn out to be um, not who they say they are and criminals trying to extort them for money. Um, online reputation, I think is something which um, which CAT and the um, Professional Online Safety Helpline probably deal with a little bit more, but um, your digital footprint is so important. And when you're a student, it's great at the time to have photos of you um, potentially intoxicated on nights out, having fun, but actually it's important to remember that those images do stay with you and you need to be careful about the access that the public has to those images. So I always say, if it's something that you don't want to see your future boss seeing, maybe put it as a friends only photo on Facebook. Um, they're really easy settings to have. It really gives you the autonomy to be able to decide who sees these images. You can have them there, but just make sure that you've got the settings in place that your potential boss isn't able to view them as well. Um, we've also seen um, student sex work on the rise, especially since the pandemic um, with students turning to sex work for that extra income. We all know student loans do not cover the lifestyle we all wish we could have. Um, I graduated fairly recently and um, I definitely can say that I lived off past of two years. Um, but um, there has been a lot of research into this area and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, of time so barriers to reporting obviously these types of crimes are incredibly embarrassing for people it's not something that they want to really go and tell the university about they're quite scared that course leaders will find out or will impact their career or they'll be kicked out of uni etc and they don't know who to talk to so we often um if anyone who comes to us if we see that they've um told us what university they're at we'll always make sure that they um have a link to the well-being services and we always try and encourage people to go and find someone to talk about it and um, I think we would we'd really like to be able to speak to more wellbeing units to uh, explain about what our services can do as well and um, the level of support we can provide. So how can you as students support a victim of intimate image abuse? So I think the big one is never blame the victim. I'm sure if anyone is here today you're probably people who wouldn't do this in the first place um, as you're here and you're wanting to learn about it. Um, and I think the phrase I've, every conference I've ever been to, um, have someone's always come up to me and say, well, I don't understand why people take the photos in the first place. And um, I could argue that the cows come home, literally, but um, everyone takes images. It's not, that's not the issue here. The issue is sharing them without consent. That is where the, the, impact needs to be put on these types of conversations that they haven't done anything wrong they are not at fault for sending those images if they're in a trusted relationship or for whatever reason they are not the one to blame and also understanding the impact of this crime it's having your most vulnerable moment shared especially if it's online for anyone to see it's an incredibly detrimental thing um, it's absolutely terrifying and um, I think just being very understanding of that what's happened can really, really benefit the victim. And reassurance that practical solutions are available. We can help. If that image is online, we can help get that down. We can help monitor the situation. If it's spread elsewhere, we can do searches. We've got lots of tools um, that we can use to try and find all those images and report and remove as much as possible. Um, and I think creating awareness of intimate image abuse as a crime and what the impact can be is really, is it would be a great thing to do. And I think through events like this, which Joe has organized, um, is really starting to make headway with that. Um, it is a crime, it is against the law to share an intimate image without consent. And people should know that. Um, even from a younger age of being in schools and colleges, they need to know that that's not an okay behaviour and the impact can be hugely, hugely detrimental to people's mental health and wellbeing. 
Um, so yeah, and we're, we're trying to um, train more staff and student leaders, and I think that's something that um, myself and Joe have had many conversations about, but if anyone has any ideas about how we can um, get our information and awareness out there, we're always really happy to, to learn more and, and take on people's ideas. And also sharing information, um, even retweeting something, you never know who can see that and who may be in need of this help and they're too scared to talk to you about it. Um, it's always um, nice to check in your friends and just share information about what's out there. Next slide, please. So we did, we do have six um, university online welfare advice postcards. So they cover uh, stalking, sex extortion, intimate image abuse, online reputation, hate speech and students and sex work. So these can all be found on our website. Printed copies, as you can see, are available. Um, they're very lovely. Um, I love the illustrations on them, but they're also free to download on our website too. So there's no cost there. They could go up around your halls, around your student housing, wherever you think people might be able to see them. Um, we're more than happy to, to send those out. Next slide, please. So back to students and sex work. So um, the Sex Work Research Hub, you can find online, have um, produced two uh, toolkits. So one for students and one for staff. So um, the aim of this is to try and um, promote awareness of um, what, what is happening with student sex workers, what issues they face, the legal status of this, um, and how you can offer appropriate support. And I think that's the big one. They are looking to review policies within universities and try and sort of lower the stigma around this. Um, there has been cases in the past where students are kicked off courses and um, they're really trying to sort of work out how they can best support students and, um, and go from there and, and really sort of look into this issue. Many universities don't like to talk about it. They don't like to admit that they have student sex workers in their university, but that's just not something we can deny anymore. Um, and I would really urge you to go and read the research there. It's, it's incredibly interesting. And I think um, you, you may be able to take something away from that as well um, for, for Goldsmiths. Next slide, please. So I think I've covered this a little bit, but training awareness and education is definitely the way forward. So we would like to see an increased training of staff and students in this area. Um, media awareness is always um, a big one for us. If, um, if we do any of this, but always trying to differentiate the difference between the crime for under 18s and 18 plus, um, as it's very, very different. The, the crime is dealt with differently um, and the overall impacts are also different um, and also the victim blaming culture which many different areas are also working on um, but I think the that the main phrase of why they take the images in the first place I think that's something really easily which uh, you could be you could stand up to someone against them and be that bystander for that victim and say actually they weren't at fault for sharing those images turn it around and perpetrate why did the perpetrator do that why did they think that behavior is okay um, and then it comes down to the education of young people understanding the law and what consequences they are and um, there is a two-year punishment uh, um, jail punishment for this crime if it goes um, forward so there is there is huge consequences and people should should know that and understand that as well next slide oh I'm at the end cool thank you um for listening I hope I didn't ramble too much but um yes shall we have any questions 